Greetings, peace and blessings to you, my listeners, on this Sunday afternoon in the new year of 2022. I pray that you are keeping healthy, safe, spiritually grounded, as well as being productive, progressive, and positive. Today, you have tuned into my live radio show called Analyze This. On this show, I invite panelists to discuss the arts, artistic events, and theater shows. I also engage my panelists to share their thoughts on recent social, health, and occasionally political issues. There will also be a rebroadcast of my Sunday shows on Wednesday evenings from 7 o'clock p.m. to 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So, if you miss the Sunday 4 o'clock p.m. show, please tune in on Wednesday nights here on New New Radio at www.newnewradio.com or radio.newnewradio.com. Once again, that's radio.nu.radio.com. Today was the anti-gun violence march in Brooklyn, organized by NYCC, also known as New York Communities for Change. The gathering for the march began at 1 o'clock p.m. this afternoon on the corner of Flatbush and Church Avenues. From this location, the march started approximately between 1.30 p.m and two o'clock p.m. and traveled all the way to Barclays Center, located at 620 Atlantic Avenue. I had an opportunity to speak briefly with one of its phenomenal leading members, Miss Mariana Davenport. I felt a bit disappointed that I could not participate in this march. So I asked Miss Davenport, if she thought New York Communities for Change would be organizing another march in the very near future. Her overall response was that it was a possibility. I wanted to commend Mariana, the leaders and members of New York Communities for Change for taking the lead in, if not the first, anti-gun violence march here in New York City. If you missed today's March in Brooklyn, like I did, I implore all of you, my listeners, to participate in the next anti-gun violence march. Better yet, you can organize your own anti-gun violence march and or demonstration right in your community and demand your local politicians to take action and even encourage members of your community to take action. We have a special treat for you today. Today, I will be interviewing a wonderfully talented person from our community of Harlem. But before I move forward with this interview, I'd like to share a few facts and current events with you. What happened on this day, May 22nd, in history? Well, on July 10th, 1954, a baby boy was born in Miami, Florida. This baby boy grew up to set a new big league standard. His name is Andre Nolan Dawson, also nicknamed the Hawk and Awesome Dawson. He is an African-American former professional baseball player and inductee into the Baseball Hall of Fame. During a 21 year baseball career, he played for four different teams as a center and right fielder, spending most of his career with the Montreal Expos from 1976 to 1986 and Chicago Cubs from 1987 to 1992. 
an eight-time National League All-Star, Dawson was named the league's Rookie of the Year in 1977 after batting .282 with 19 home runs and 65 runs batted in RBI. And he won the Most Valuable Player Award in 1987 after leading the league with 49 homers and 137 RBIs. So why is he also a memorable figure today? in American history? Well, on this day in 1990, the Cincinnati Reds issued Dawson five intentional walks in one game to set a new big league standard. The five bases on balls came in a game that lasted 16 innings and Dawson still managed to one for three at the plate and his three official at-bats. You go, Dawson. <laughs> okay, moving forward. What's going on in the arts? Number one, Little Girl Blue, a phenomenal one-woman musical show about the illustrious African-American singer, songwriter, musician, arranger, and civil rights activist, Miss Eunice Kathleen Wayman known professionally as Nina Simone. Her music spans styles, including classical jazz, blues, folk, R&B, gospel, and pop. Little Girl Blue, written and starring Lyona Michelle, is being performed at New World Stages, located at 340 West 50th Street here in New York City. And of course, performances are scheduled to run through May 22nd. For tickets, call 212-239-6200 or log on to www.littlegirlblue.nyc. Next, Miss Camille Brown directed and choreographed the Broadway revival of Entosaki's Shange choreo poem for color girls who have considered suicide when the rainbow is enough. The show will run through August 14th. Performances will be at the Booth Theater located at 222 West 45th Street between Broadway and 8th Avenue here in Manhattan. Contact www.telecharge.com. For colored girls who have considered suicide when the rainbow is enough. Next, Oya a dance drama representing the spiritual aspects of the Yoruba spirituality reopened last Thursday, May 20th at the Black Spectrum Theater. Its show dates are from May 20th through May 29th. For tickets, contact www.blackspectrum.net or call 718-723-1800. Black Spectrum Theater is located on 177th Street and Baisley Boulevard in Jamaica, Queens. Come and be dazzled by this electrifying performance. Next, the Theater of American Actors presents on May 26th, the Buffalo Hero of World War I, the Wayne Minor Story. And it returns for its third production run. Written and directed by Mr. Kenthito Robinson, the play is about Kansas City's fallen African-American or Buffalo soldier hero, Wayne Minor of the 92nd Division of World War I. He was the last soldier to die in that war. The play was well received during his first and second production run, so it promises to be equally riveting during its third time around. Once again, playing at the American Theater of Actors located at 314 West 54th Street. The play will run from May 26th through June 5th. For tickets, contact Eventbrite. If you would like to advertise or promote your upcoming event here on Nunu Radio, please contact me at analyzethis at nunuradio.com. That's A-N-A-L-Y. Z-E-T-H-I-S at 
N-U-N-U-R-A-D-I-O dot com. You can also contact info at nunuradio.com or call and leave a detailed message at 917-668-9372. If you would like to leave a donation, please visit our website at www.nunuradio.com or radio.nunuradio.com. And now for our special treat. Today, we have Miss Tammy Tyree, who will be discussing her portrayal of the 19th century African-American presidential dressmaker and entrepreneur, Mrs. Elizabeth Keckley, in the recent fantabulous presentation of Colored Silk, a Civil War Odyssey. Exactly two weeks ago, I had the privilege of attending Miss Tyree's presentation at the Grinnell Community Room at 800 Riverside Drive here in New York City. Before I move forward with today's interview, I'd like to share a little bit of Miss Tyree's background. Miss Tammy Tyree is a multidisciplinary artistic or artist <laughs> dedicated to telling the African American story. Tammy is a graduate of Howard University's theater and communications departments, a singer, actress, writer, playwright, illustrator, educator, historian, and public speaker. Tammy created a cultural program in 2008, which she calls Echoes of Our Ancestors, African-American History and Song. Its mission? is to present music, theater, storytelling, and literature, which challenges what we think we know about people, places, and movements in the Black American soldier. Echoes of Our Ancestors is a nonprofit performance program focusing on urban participants at schools, libraries, culture, and civic places. The themes are the heartbeat of its principal performer and researcher, Tammy Tyree. With a repertoire of gospel, blues, jazz, and cabaret, Miss Tyree has appeared as a so solo, <laughs> tongue twister there. She has appeared as a solo vocalist at the United Nations on the soundtrack of 12 Years of Slave, which received the Academy Award for Best Picture in 2014. Yes, indeed, I remember that film very well. In 2018, Tammy traveled to Nigeria with her friend, Chief Joyce Adewumi, for a spiritual and cultural pilgrimage, which was documented in the film produced by Miss Adewumi, We Are the Endless Roar. Her voice has reverberated in concert and cabaret halls and as a lead vocalist for numerous choirs and choruses throughout her lifetime. Her musical about the love of Frederick Douglass entitled A Seat at the Table, Dinner with Frederick Douglass premiered in 2019. Ms. Tyree is the recipient of numerous awards and accolades, including the Upper Manhattan Empowerment Zone, Harlem Arts Alliance, and Lower Manhattan Cultural Grants. She is a frequent performer and lecturer for the African American Division of the North Carolina Historical Society and author of self-published journals, including Reflections on 12 Years a Slave, following Frederick Douglass, and most recently, Motown Digest, everything you need to know about the greatest record company in history. Amen to that. <laughs> and now, without further ado, I give you Miss Tammy Tyree. Good afternoon, Miss Tyree, uh, correction. Good afternoon, Tammy. How are you feeling today? 
I'm great. <laughs> Are you taking in this beautiful but humid weather? <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> okay. As long as you're keeping cool, that's all that's important. Yes. So I'd like to jump right into our discussion about your role of Mrs. Elizabeth Keckley. You have had some very well-received responses from audience members for your portrayal of Mrs. Elizabeth Keckley. I need to also add that this presentation was written and directed by you, of course, and that is indeed phenomenal. Tell us, that is, your listeners, how and why you chose to write a one-woman show about the phenomenal and historical African-American woman, Elizabeth Keckley. Well, first of all, let me thank you again for inviting me uh, to be on this wonderful program. By the way, you have a fabulous speaking voice. I thank hope you, you sing. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I, I, hope you <laughs> <laughs> I have to say at the moment, I stopped taking singing lessons, but thank you so much. I think I will go back to them. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, um, let me let me start back up just a little bit because the, the prompt that began this whole uh, writing escapade, which it took me a year to write this play, um, began with the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, which is better known as a SALA. And for those listeners who may not be so familiar with that organization, it's a national organization of historians, um, mostly uh, lettered historians from colleges and universities. Um, but um, myself, I am a public historian and we were founded by Carter G. Woodson. So we have a branch here in Harlem and there's also a branch in the Bronx. And in March of 2021, the president of our branch wanted to do, uh, ask certain people if they wanted to do little vignettes on various women in African-American history. And at the time I was reading um, Elizabeth Keckley's uh, narrative, which is called Behind the Scenes or 30 Years a Slave and Four Years in the White House. I was reading her book. So I decided Although most people were taking much more famous individuals, you know, like Harriet Tubman and Sojourner Truth and, you know, people that everybody knows. I said that I would do my vignette. It was online, of course, um, on Elizabeth Keckley. So I did a, a dramatic uh, summarization, which is on YouTube. It's about nine minutes where I give an overview of, of who she is. And after that, by the time I finished reading the book and everything, I just kept writing. <laughs> I just kept writing. And what it turned into was ended up being a, a one act, a long one act, but it's about an hour and 10 minutes. Um, one act story. Um, I, didn't, I didn't know I was going to be writing a play. Um, but that is totally how I work. <laughs> if you ask me what I'm gonna be doing three months from now, I would tell you I have no idea. Um, my whole program is very much um, built on intuition, spontaneity, um, immediate insight into something, some kind of information comes to me and I, I call myself the echo of our ancestors because really and truly ancestors do speak to me. And so when someone speaks to me or certain information is put there that I would have to trip over if, if, I, if, if I wanted to move, it's, it, it appears to me very clearly that I'm supposed to be speaking for that person. So some of the people that I have spoken for in the past have been, um, 
Mahalia Jackson and her her songwriter uh, Thomas Dorsey. Um, I never thought that I would be speaking for Frederick Douglass, but for the past three or four years, I've been doing a lot of speaking for Frederick Douglass, and every year now I have a festival about Frederick Douglass, and I still can't tell you how I found out about this woman. Um, some research I was doing, I don't know what it was exactly. Um, I can tell you about how I, you know, came across the other two people that I mentioned, but she's truly someone that I didn't really know about, and somewhere, somehow, I don't know, maybe it was a book I was buying. I buy a lot of uh, books on Amazon about different historical people or something. Maybe they put her book in forth. I don't really know. No one told me about her. And I just started reading it and became fascinated with it. And so things just evolved. Um, and certainly I never thought that I would be, even when I wrote the play, I never wrote it with myself in mind. Um, as you heard me say, I still call myself a singer. Um, I have been singing since I was five and I have sung professionally most of my life and never really thought about doing any kind of dramatic acting. And that is to say, I've never, I've never done a non-singing role is what I'm saying to you. Um, and even when I was at Howard University at the time, Howard University did not have a musical theater program, which they have now. Um, but I wanted to go to the school very much so. So I, you know, I was involved in other things and I, <laughs> And I was off campus a lot because I was involved in a professional singing group. So I never thought that I would be um, playing the role. And I started out, um, you know, as a playwright wanting to hear my script. And so it started as me doing readings just to, you know, check the temperature in the room and see, you know, how this was going to be received but I fell in love with playing the role. And um, I'm, I, you know, and that's how it, how it developed. And so I'm very much, um, I'm very, very uh, happy about the response that it got um, from a uh, historical viewpoint, um, from a writing viewpoint. And I surprised myself as an actress. <laughs> Wow. You know, so, uh, you know, life is full of surprises and um, that is that is so me. I'm such a um, uh, what's the word I want to say for myself that people that know me would describe me as someone who is very spontaneous, always doing all kind of things and definitely uh, challenges herself. So I guess I, I guess this is. This is just another escapade for me. <laughs> well, Tammy, I have to admit, I, I'm fascinated with what you are sharing with our listeners today. And you are a wealth of information and education. And forgive me, you have already uh, responded to some of the questions that I had already planned to ask you, but that's okay. Um, because I will ask those questions in a direct form just for our listeners who are logging in late. And yeah, that's fine. Uh, when I approached you at the end of your presentation two weeks ago, you informed me again that you were a singer. So I'm curious, did you have to do any specific character preparation for your portrayal of Mrs. Elizabeth Keckley? I'm gonna say no, and I'll tell you why. Um, <clears throat> because I had um, done a lot of research um, on the Civil War, done a lot of research on 
the United States colored troops and um, consider myself to be a historian of, well, well, all, let me, all historians have a certain uh, period of time that they consider their expertise. So although I, I say that I'm a historian and a public historian I'm, is what I'm saying, a public historian of African-American history, my, my specialty, if you will, or the area that I'm most involved, immersed in, is the slavery period. So to understand this person, a lot of what you need to understand is the, the surroundings and the situation and even the nuances of, of that situation. The other thing about her that uh, when I was reading her book that I, I, I realized, and I may be touching on another question <laughs> that you, but um, allow me to just, you know, um, I realized that there were certain things about her that I had in common. So um, it just so, and it also just so happens, you heard me say that I work a lot with the North Carolina Historical Society. So let me just pinpoint that a little bit better because that has something to do with why I took, took on this project. Um, the African-American History Division, okay? And the, the, in, when I've gone there many times, they have an authentic group they had an authentic group of uh, a colored troop in New Bern, North Carolina, where, where the historical society is that I, you know, spend a lot of time at doing lectures and things. And they have a group of volunteer men who reenact that their colored troop from the Civil War. And I became very fascinated with that whole idea that these men who were enslaved, once the Union Army came into the territory and took over, that literally swept up these men, gave them uh, uniforms, and they started to fight against their own masters. And I've been, I'm just totally just, this just blows me away. I just I have to tell you. So I, I got into this whole big thing about the colored troops. And so when I found out, you know, her, how her story touches in on that, all of this, I just feel like it was just meant to be. So I, don't, I didn't really have to, I, I feel that I really had so much to embody and understand. And I felt that, I, and I feel that I really understand this person and the climate that she was in. And I'm really, uh, really into these colored troops right now. You know, and I started to get all kind of information about that. And I did some research about military music and all kinds of things. So I, I really do feel that I'm this person and, I, and that I'm supposed to be, uh, be her now, that she's channeling through me. Wow. Wow, that's remarkable. So that brings me to another question, Tammy. At the end of your presentations, at whatever venues you perform in, do you feel a sense of accomplishment or fulfillment in your portrayal of this character? I, I, I really feel I'm this character, but I know that this character is not a household name. So I know that when people walk in to see this, well, I have encouraged people to watch the little nine minute vignette um, before they come, which doesn't give you an indication of what I'm gonna talk about when you see the play, but it just gives you some background history on the woman. But I don't know that everybody did that. So a lot of people are coming into the room they're there because they are my followers. Um, they are there. Maybe they read a little synopsis about, but they don't know a, a lot about, they certainly don't. There's a lot of people 
don't know me and they don't know this character. So you are already, you know, you're, you have a, a little, a steep hill to climb, but everything that I do is, is based in history. Okay. Um, I, my, I have a program echoes of our ancestors and it's not just theater. It's, I take on a topic or a subject or a movement or a person and I figure out how I'm going to tell that story and which whatever way I feel the story will be best told is how it happens. So my goal is to always what I can what I can be sure of is that everybody that leaves something that I've done whether it's a concert or you know in this case it's a play Everybody leaves with knowing more than they did when they came in. That does not mean that they liked it or that they were, you know, were interested or whatever. I can't guarantee that. But I do I do know that you you walk out of there with information that you didn't have. And even if it's a person that you've heard of a million times over. If I've been called to talk about that person, there's some different angle. I'm not, I don't really go at things at the normal angle. If there's nothing new to be said, I don't bother with it because there's millions of people out there. Um, and so that's, if, you know, if I'm sure that you were listening and I'm sure that you, you know, were there and really paying attention, then I can I can be satisfied that you're going to leave out of there with some information, um, whether whether you liked it artistically or not. I hope that answers the question. <laughs> Absolutely, Tammy, and I am a witness. I can attest to that. Yes, I walked out of that presentation knowing much more than I did before. Absolutely. During your presentation of Elizabeth Keckley, you had two co-actors and a singer perform. The two co-actors read extraordinary letters that were carefully and wonderfully crafted by you. The singer also sang near the end of your presentation. Tell us about the content of the two letters and the song. Why did you choose to add the letter and singing components to your presentation? I'm glad you asked that question. Thank you. Because none of that is in my script. So let me start first by saying, let me clarify something. As you know, since you saw the, pro the production, there are a lot of letters that are read, right? in the story and move yes. the story along. Yes. So the, the letters, you know, from my son and the letter from my husband, those are letters that are part of my script. I, I created those letters. However, the letters that were read by the two actors are real letters. Those are letters that were actually written to Abraham Lincoln and are in the National Archives. Mm. The, 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 the name of the person who, you know, is Hannah Johnson uh, is a real person. She wrote that letter to Abraham Lincoln. And we have to assume that at some point, certain letters actually got on his desk. Um, James Henry Gooding, that letter, is a very famous letter. Uh, he was actually a soldier, just as um, uh, Hannah Johnson was a mother of an actual soldier. Those are real letters. And so during my research, and remember, I told you I'm in love with the United States colored troops. <laughs> <laughs> These are, I, I found, you know, again, this is why I'm very convinced that you know, when, when, when I take on something or something, 
information just comes right in front of my face. So a book came out um, by written by Deborah Willis, and she it came out in January of of uh, 2022, and this book came right into my face, and it has all the le many letters um, from the National Archives. So I read that book from cover to cover many times, and then I read a lot of other letters from the National Archives, and I chose those two letters to propel the story. And the actors, Andrew Horton and Laura Bowman, I know them from um, a few years ago. I was in, well, I still consider myself in Harlem Playwrights 21, and I met them there. And um, I thought that they would be uh, very excellent reading. Also, I had Johnny May. Johnny May read uh, in February because this play, uh, I did this play the entire month of February in the same location on Sunday afternoons. And uh, on several occasions in February, Johnny May read uh, the letter from Hannah Johnson. So uh, yes, I chose those individuals. I felt that they would be um, very uh, good with, with those letters. And by the and also Johnny May is also in the although she's an acclaimed you know she's an acclaimed actress as we all know. But in addition to which, she and I are both in the history group, the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. So yes, I chose them. I, I felt they would be interested and they would, um, you know, portray those individuals who wrote the letters. And uh, this time, the, the, the uh, performances I did leading up to Mother's Day, the encore performances, if you will, I, I had um, Lawrence Craig Jr., um, who I know through in the musical world, you know, um, and I, I wanted Deep River song. So uh, that I, I chose him uh, to, you know, to do that. Wonderful, wonderful. To my listeners, you have tuned in to Analyze This with your host, Patricia Fields. Today, my special guest, Miss Tammy Tyree is sharing her experience in her presentation or recent presentation of Mrs. Elizabeth Keckley. For those of you who would like more information about Tammy Tyree and her performances, I will share that with you towards the end of our wonderful interview. Tammy, for our listeners who have just joined in, by the end of your portrayal of Mrs. Elizabeth Keckley, what was the theme or main message that you wanted your audience to partake from the presentation? It's hard for me to, to think of one main, there's, there's a lot of things I, that I aspired to. Um, but I think what I wanted people to really um, understand is that in, 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 you know, one of the things was that the more things change, the more they stay the same mm -hmm. because she, you know, this was a woman, I was emphasizing her 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 um, struggle with motherhood and um, her you know dilemma about raising her child and you know that was a big part of the story um, and you know I also wanted to make people I'm cheating I'm not giving you one. <laughs> 
but I also wanted people to to see to to think about a woman who spent more than half of her life enslaved. Then she raises this enormous amount of money to get out of slavery, to buy her freedom. She builds a huge business. I mean, she had 20 people working for her, you know, and she's, you know, working, you know, sewing beautiful clothes and everything for this, the top brass in Washington, D.C. And, you know, she's leading this privileged status. Um, but, you know, at the same time, look at, if you remember the story, I spend quite a bit of time talking about the sexual trauma, how she was, uh, you know, given over for four years to be this, her master's friend's uh, prostitute. Yes. You know, and so I guess what I was trying to show was that how she made it into this elite world, but she was still traumatized by all of these things. And, you know, how she was able to do something that most women weren't even able to do at that time. She had a business. Women did not have a business, you know, not even white women. And so her story to me is like, you know, I, I call it like glamour and grit, you know, all at once. I mean, it's just so, and yet a lot of the things that she was talking about, you know, trying to figure out how to raise her son and what to do with her son in the middle of a war. And, uh, you know, as a mother of two sons, you know, I, I really relate to, and I know there's lots of mothers out there that, you know, you have all these decisions that you, that you are, you know, about child raising and, and so forth. And so I wanted people, although her story is historical and it's based in, you know, there's so much about her story that we can still relate to. Um, and, you know, how she was able to navigate through, the, through these things and make, well, you know, the, the best decisions that she thought she could make at the time. So it's, it's, there's a lot of layers, I think, to her, to her story and her life. And I mean, everybody can come out of there with something different, you know, in terms of what you think was the most important aspect of her but you know if you read her book you know her book was uh, about the fact that she you know was um mary todd lincoln's uh dressmaker and that was her claim to fame and her claim to you know a, a great status and so forth and i wanted to bring out uh more than what's in the book because in her book we get one line about her son dying in the, you know, that her son died in the civil war. And I think that's because the editors, they didn't, they didn't want to, you know, they just want, they just cared about her as a dressmaker, you know? And we got a couple of lines about what happened to her, you know, growing up with her slave, you know, in slavery. And, and so I've been, I've really been on this mission to humanize um people who were enslaved they had they had lives they had thoughts they had emotions they had loves they they lost they won just like us and you know they're they're sort of iconic kind of mythological people and but there's so much more and so i you know that's what i wanted to also i want to humanize uh those of us who were enslaved. Tammy, Long answer, sorry. <laughs> uh, beautiful, beautiful. I, I will repeat what I said a few minutes ago. You are a wealth of information and education. And I am trying my best to keep up with you as I'm writing notes in my notebook. <laughs> so moving forward. Um, I know that there have been a lot of adults in the age range, let's say between 30 and 90, who have attended your presentations. True. 
Were there any children or teenagers among the audience mix? And if so, what were or what have been their responses? Well, when I did when I did the, the play in February, on my flyer and in my promotional materials, I had I wrote that it was not suitable for children under 16. Um, because there is a lot of things, as you know, that are discussed that would glean a lot of questions that we don't have time to really answer at that moment. So, you know, because I start out right from the gate, the first five or 10 minutes, I talk about her constant rape and, you know, being handed over to, you know, I start out that way and I talk about the sexual trauma and all of that. And so I think it's not a play for people who don't have a certain background in uh, the Civil War or the complexities of slavery. Um, it, you know, it, it deals with some things. Mm -hmm. um, so I did have one or two young people there and they asked me questions about things that I didn't have the time <laughs> or anything to really answer, you know, for those very reasons. I, it, you know, it's, 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 a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, um, it's a story that you need, you know, some, you, you have to have some kind of understanding about uh, chattel slavery in America and about why, about the Civil War, why it was fought. Um, uh, because my play talks about, um, in addition to the fact that it's the Civil War, a big part of the discussion. In February, I had some talkbacks after the show. And my play talks about the fact that she was in the Midwest, in St. Louis, and they were like, straddling the fence they were they were not uh they they were they were pro-slavery in some situations but they were they had not left the union and so that that's a lot of the confusion that i have her talking about with her son you know so not only am i talking about the civil war but i'm explaining to people about the border states and what what the confusion that went on there and how they waged war within themselves. Um, so these are very complicated um, topics. So it's not really it's not really for that audience. It it really isn't. Um, so I did like I said I did have one or two young people, and you know it's good for them to ask questions. So maybe this will lead them to, um, you know trying to find out more about slavery and the Civil War um, as, you know, to start out. Tammy, it, it's interesting. Um, I am reminded that as we engage in this interview, there is a strong and huge campaign across this country, book banning. I call it the book banning epidemic. Yes. Um, and it's sad to know, this is the 21st century, 2022 right. in America, it's sad to know the number of states and communities across this country that have campaigned and are moving full speed ahead with removing historical books from not only school libraries, but public libraries as well and historical books about the Civil War, about the Civil Rights Movement, about World War I, World War II, the African slave trade, the accomplishments of, of African-American people in this country throughout history. They're removing yes. all of that information from the libraries. 
and I can continue on. Novels are included too. Novels written by uh, African American uh, writers, uh, yes. Latino writers, Asian writers, LGBTQ writers, and it goes on and on and on. It's frightening. So I guess hearing you say that, it is very much a part of who we are in American history. And I fear that the next generation of young people will grow up, if you will, as idiots, not knowing the history of the land that they live on. And that's across the ethnic board, across the ethnic and racial board in this country. It's frightening. But well, <laughs> it is frightening, but those books are distorted and they don't tell the truth anyway. So what needs to happen is new books, new stories, and we cannot wait for, um, I, I, like I said, I'm, I was just saying, I'm all for people learning. I'm just saying that my particular story, this story is not 101. You know, you have to start somewhere else before you get to this, to my story, to the story that I'm telling. Mm -hmm. um, that's what I'm saying. Um, in fact, the reason why I started Echoes of Our Ancestors, because this play is just a part of a greater initiative. So in 2008, I started an initiative called Echoes of Our Ancestors. Well, the full name is Echoes of Our Ancestors, African-American History and Song. So the purpose was that I, my own sons, who are now 28 and 25, um, I, 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 I was really worried at a very early age that they would grow up, that I knew that they would not get their history. Um, and I, I figured out a way that I was going to teach them, but I had to do it in an artistic way because that's, that's my toolkit, you know? So really I began this program trying to teach uh, young people and I spent time at schools and everything else. I was there um, and doing things that I thought, you know, but a lot of the things that I, I would use music and arts and um, to to tell tell the stories, you know, tell our story. Um, but I, I have to tell you, unfortunately, there are a lot of us who don't want our story told. Um, so I think first of all, the first thing that people need to do is to face their own identity and who they are, and. Um, I think that history, being able to accept your history and know your history and clarify your history, it should give you a better self-esteem. Um, but there are people out there who don't want to accept who they are and they don't want their children to know to learn certain things. So I think to it is terrible and it's wrong that books are being obliterated because you can, you know, the truth is always going to be the truth, no matter what. So taking away the book is, you know, it, people will just find another way, those who are truth seekers. But at the same time, we, the Black people, we, the Latino people, we, the Asian people, whoever it is, you know, that feels that their story or their culture is, is being um, disrespected or maligned in this country. It's, it's, uh, it's your responsibility to get that information out to the next generations. And so as artists, we, we can do that. Um, we have the luxury of telling stories from our perspective and our lens 
It should not be the only way, you're right. It should be told fairly in textbooks and taught. Um, but let's just assume that it's not going to be. And so we have to tell our own stories and educate our own in, in, as, you know, in different ways and at different levels. Um, and like I said, I, I have spent uh, several years in, you know, in schools. Um, wasn't always about teaching um, cultural history. You know, I've even been there teaching penmanship and, you know, and singing and doing all kinds of things. But Echoes of Our Ancestors is a very advanced um, program. It is not um, designed for, at this point, it is not designed for beginning. Um, uh, it, is, it is a very um, uh, higher level of, of thinking, rearranging thoughts. And it does require uh, that you have, in most situations, it does require that you have some basic information or the desire to uh, clarify or, or edify or rewrite some, some train of thought. Uh, most of my uh, followers um, are scholars. They are professors themselves. They are people who are uh, very culturally and uh, educationally astute. Um, that, that's just where, be, that's because of what I want to question and what I want to, to answer. Um, but yes, it definitely is something that we all need to be aggressive about and, and, and teach our own. That's what we have to do. Wonderful, wonderful. My next question, Tammy, for every show or performance, the caliber, or if you will, the personality of the audience is different. Some audiences are dead silent throughout the show because they are absorbing every single word that is being said on the stage. Then, you have other audiences that are quite exuberant, that is very lively and responsive to everything presented on that stage. You have been performing this role, the role of Elizabeth Keckley, for quite some time now. Tell us about the type of audiences that you have experienced during your presentations. Yeah, I'm glad you asked that question because as a live performer, we do, you know, although, you know, you're taught in drama school and so forth, the fourth wall and, you know, kind of, you do have to judge the temperature in the room. So, yeah, you are absolutely right. I noticed different things with, with different audiences. Um, there were audiences in the very beginning when I did it in February in particular, um, that they were, they were like in shock, <laughs> you know? There were people that would just, you know, if I, were, if I were able to, if I wanted to look at some people's expressions, the looks of horror, you know? But when you're talking about enslavement and people, you know, from that standpoint, it's, it's, you know, people will be, you know, it's, it's not a good thing. Um, there were, there were, I, you know, I, of course, you know, I wrote my own script, of course, and I'm performing it. So there were times, because there were times when I felt, that maybe this was all over their head. Mm. 
And so I remember something that I did that I said in one of the performances that wasn't in my script. And it went over well and everybody laughed. Um, the line was, <laughs> I'm gonna say it to you because you're an actress as well. So I was talking about, remember when I was talking about the $1,200 that she had to raise, which is yes. the equivalent yeah. of like a million dollars in today's money. So I, one of the performances I, I said, they looked baffled. And I said, well, you know, I, and I was saying how my master had was poor and he did he had never had that much money himself and i and i said this line it was an imp, it was improvised i said if twelve hundred dollars was perfume they he wouldn't have been able to smell it and it just you know i i didn't plan it it just came and everyone laughed and i think that was really good because when you're doing something that's really heavy you need to have some some moments of you know comic relief or something that's funny mm -hmm. or something. And so after I did that, after I said that, which you know was it was improvised, I started to do that in the in the rest of the performances. And each time I got that kind of a response because you know you need. I, I, so sometimes you have to um, you have to you have to gauge the audience. Sometimes there were times when I would say a line, something I was talking about, something that they probably didn't know about the border state and about you know this infighting. And I remember I repeated it again, you know, so that they could really um, you know catch on to what I was saying. Um, you know, so it was little things like that. But I remember um, you can't always tell about an audience because sometimes, um, you know, they can be looking deadpan and they can look like Frankenstein or something, you know, and then all of a sudden they jump to their feet and give you a standing ovation. So you <laughs> thought they weren't with you. You know, you thought they weren't, you know, whatever. You think they're not with you and they are. You know what I mean? Yes, so absolutely. I, you know, I, I received letters. I received um, text messages. I, I got all kind of emails from people. Wow, this was really memorable. You know, I got all kinds of, um, so yeah, it, you know, it was just, but you're right. It was, um, it was something that it, it's, it, it's a tough show. I mean, it's a tough story. It's, you know, <laughs> So yeah, I, I, I found a couple of ways to have some comedic breaks in there, you know, <laughs> which I think really worked, you know? Oh, fabulous. To my listeners, you have logged on to Analyze This with your host, Patricia Fields, and my wonderful guest, Miss Tammy Tyree, multidisciplinary artist who recently performed a piece that she had written and direct in the presentation of Mrs. Elizabeth Keckley, or shall I say the portrayal of Mrs. Elizabeth Keckley. Tammy, I'm going to ask you this question. Of course, you have already answered it, but it's okay, especially for our, view, uh, our listeners who have just joined in. Some people have said that performance reviews are necessary to have, while others say that reviews are just a total waste of people's biased opinions. Have you received any reviews of your presentation? And if so, what are the responses or comments in those reviews? Well, <clears throat> yes, um, there have been, there, the, uh, play was uh, attended by people in the theater industry. And then of course, there's the audience. So um, there were broad, there's, um, there were uh, several Broadway producers that came in February. Um, and they put in writing and um, 
online and so forth, uh, different reviews. So one is a, a one woman tour de force. <laughs> Uh, another one is, uh, let's see, he said it was just amazing, you know, in inspirational, educational, just, you know, just glowing reviews from some producers that were there. Um, and then, of course, there's the audience, you know. Uh, like I said, I've received letters, uh, texts, uh, emails, all kinds of um, uh, encouraging uh, uh and also people who um, who I live around who had, who had no idea of what, I, what it is I do that actually came um, and you're still, you know, talking to me about it. So the reviews that I got were very, very good and very, very high. But I personally, as I had said much earlier, I don't really worry too much about reviews because um, at the end of the day, I am a historical program and I'm an educational program. So my overarching goal is to for you to learn something or to question something that you thought you already knew. So if you learn something or go out, go out of the door, you know, knowing something or thinking, rethinking something. Then as far as I'm concerned, you know, it's good. Um, so, you know, but in, if your reviews are very important, obviously, you know, particularly um, for situations like uh, a Broadway play where, you know, people are spending uh, several hundred for that seat and they, and the, you know, people read reviews and yeah, they, if it's if you know several important people from media or, or print or say that this production is great, that's going to help the show. And likewise, if it if they you know if a lot of negative reviews come out, that's going to hurt the show. Yes, there's we so we can't we can't ignore re, you know reviews, but it's just a it's just a matter of what is that going to make you do or not do. You know, I think that's the way that that you think about reviews. You know, how is it going to change you, or or are you or is it going to change you? But you certainly can't ignore them. I don't think that they are to be ignored. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Well said. Well said. Each time you perform the role of Mrs. Elizabeth Keckley. Do you find yourself making adjustments or changes to the character, the character's delivery, and your stage blocking? Well, I feel my next goal is to take it into a bigger um, venue. And I, I, think, I think in another setting, that probably would be, you know, whatever I was doing would be questioned, you know? Um, I didn't really change it a lot, you know? Um, you know, because I was in the same space and very intimate space. Um, but, you know, I, I could see where going forward, if it were, you know, in a, in a different setting, yeah, I think, you know, as as performers, you know, you your setting has a lot to do with how you how you do something or how you approach it. Yeah, I mean, um, I you know, like I said, most most of my um, performing experiences have been through music, and I know like when I'm you know performing in a club or or something like that, you know, you've got to. For me, I always make sure I see that club well in advance and, you know, pop into that club to get the feel of that room and, and see how, you know, just to feel a part of it because it's, it's important that you, that your environment, that you absorb the environment and the environment 
And when I say the environment, I'm, at that point, I'm not talking about people. I'm talking about the space and the way it is, the room. And so that you, you feel at ease in the room. So I think that is important. And I think all performers know that, that, um, you know, how you perform at, uh, 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 I, I don't know. I was in a I was a soloist at a, in a concert at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and uh, you know that's a different space than maybe you know singing in your church. You know what I'm saying? So you yes, you have to adjust and and really feel the space that you're in, and know how how you're going to navigate yourself, and it does make a difference. So so wherever I'm going. And I'm shopping around for, for where I'm going to do this. It's it it has to be in harmony with the way that this an atmosphere for this character and for what I'm doing, you know. Um, and yeah, so that is important, and it and it does make a difference in how you're going to present yourself. Wonderful, Tammy. Do you have any? acting role models? And if so, who are they and why? Okay. Um, well, I mean, I, there, there are a lot of actors and actresses that I love their work, their body of work, and I respect their work. So I can name a few of them. Is that what you, you know? <laughs> okay, that would be great. I, not that I can say that I have, um, because I, again, I, I'm still not quite considering myself an actress. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm still, I'm, you know, this is the first acting, you know, straight acting, non-musical thing that I have done. So it's not as if I'm really um, modeling myself after anyone's particular but, you know, I love, I can tell you some people who I really love and respect there. And this is just a snapshot of people. This is not everybody, of course. But some of the first names that come out, and I'm going to, I'm naming African-Americans, okay, even though, you know, I know there's other great actresses, but I'm, I'm just going to drill it down. I love Debbie Allen. Um, I think she's, uh, because she's everything. She's uh She's a singer, she's a dancer, she's an actress, she's a director, she's a producer. Um, and Felicia Rashad, um, they're before me, but they're my Howard people. Yes, Howard people. that is correct, yes. Of course, I'm gonna say Chadwick Boseman was, was totally amazing. Um, who doesn't respect the work of Sidney Poitier, God rest his soul, mm -hmm. Washington, uh, Viola Davis, you know, um, and I like, I really, I also really like Anjanu Ellis. I hope I'm pronouncing her first name correctly, but I, I've seen a lot of things, a lot of her work, and I, I really like her uh, as an actress. I like her work, and there's so many people, but, you know, those are just some of the movie actors that I would throw out there. I really like Trezana. I know I'm not pronouncing her name right. Trezana Beverly. Uh, How does she yes. pronounce it? Yes, Trezana Beverly. Yes. Yes, I really, I saw her in the original for Colored Girls and I've seen some other work that she, whenever she's in anything, I go to see that. So um, yeah, there's, there's um, but most of the people I model myself after are singers. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm still, you know, I'm still not claiming myself as an actress, but, uh, you know, so, you know, but those are, those are actors that, that I, and actresses that I, that I support their work and, and go out there all the time to see. Fantastic. Tammy, do you see yourself writing about and performing the roles of more historical women in American history in the future? Um, I'm certainly open to it. I'm certainly open to it. 
uh, you know, someone has to someone has to come to me. Someone has to. Um, I never know what I'm going to do next. I'm being very honest with you. Um, something, something, or someone, or something inspires me, or prompts me, or comes to me. Uh, something came to me in a dream once, and I did something with that. So I, I, I cannot tell you what I'm going to do next. But there are very interesting people, um, and it would have to be someone. I tried. I tried to find interesting, not so well known people. Usually, somebody who needs their story to be told on a larger scale, um, someone who maybe has been misunderstood or underrated or, you know, usually I, I go with some, something, someone or something like that. Um, so there is, remember I told you that I'm in love with the United States colored troops. So during my research, I found out that there's, there's a woman who, who um, was in the colored troops uh, pretending to be a man. Yes. She was actually a female and she was in the colored troops as fighting as a male. So that's the kind of story that, you know, piques my interest. I don't know if I would be, you know, I'm not saying I'm working on it, but it's that kind of thing. I do a lot of research um, before I come out with anything. So in my, you know, something may come forward, you know? I will say this though, I am very interested in spending more time um, talking about things that directly concern women, women's uh, issues, women's situations. So I will tell you for sure that I am planning to do something very extraordinary um, for Women's History Month uh, 2023. And so it, it will be a plethora of things because I am multidisciplinary, but um, I, I am more interested in really concentrating on things that, that women are concerned about directly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fabulous, fabulous. What? Okay, so that answers my next question. Um, <laughs> so you mentioned for Women's Month for the year 2023. Yes. Correct? Okay. Yeah, I have something really, really exciting that's going to happen. I yeah. am definitely looking forward to it. Absolutely. Uh, so I think that pretty much wraps it up with regards to the questions I had for you. I want to thank you so very much for coming on the show, Tammy, and sharing your experiences in the portrayal of Mrs. Elizabeth Keckley in your phenomenally written presentation of Colored Silk, A Civil War Odyssey. I also like to encourage my listeners to visit Miss Tammy Tyree's website at Tammy Echoes of Our Ancestors.com. That's T A M I E C H O E S O F O U R A N C E S T O R S dot com. You can see Miss Tyree's nine minute characterization of Mrs. Elizabeth Keckley, or you can listen to her sing on her YouTube channel, Tammy Tyree. You can also go to the SoundCloud, Tammy Tyree. And just for the purpose of spelling, Tammy, once again, T-A-M-I, and the second name, T-Y-R-E-E. -E. Today is Sunday, and you probably had some things already planned for the day. 
However, if you would like to, and if you have the time to stay on the air and answer a few questions from our listeners or panelists, that would be great. Well, I'd certainly love to talk. <laughs> <laughs> great. As you can see, <laughs> words are my friend. Wonderful. So I would be more than happy to do that. I want to thank you again for having me and for coming to my presentation. And you have the most beautiful speaking voice. Thank you so much, Tammy. Thank you. Yes. And I know that you're a very fine actress. I, I believe I've seen some things. I know I have. Um, and so I, I, th I thank you so much for having me. And it's great to know that you have such a broadcast. And I definitely uh, did uh, let people know. I don't know who's on the air or, or, or anything like that. But it's great to know that such a thing exists. And I, I'm just, I'm very grateful. I, I was very nervous. I didn't know. I hope I did okay. But you did thank fine. You so yes. Much. You did wonderful. You did wonderful, Tammy. So yes, I, I can answer a few questions by all means. All right. So the floor is open to my um, listeners on Zoom, also my panelists. Um, I will acknowledge my uh, usual panelist members. They are Yehuda Carter, Deborah Liverman, David Brooks, and of course, my tech guru, always working hard behind the scenes, Frederick Michaels. And I'd like to acknowledge another young lady, uh, Shakiva Harris. I hope I'm pronouncing that name correctly. Thank you so much for logging into today's show and interview. The floor is open for any questions that you may have for Tammy Tyree. Any questions? Miss Tammy uh, Tyree, David Brooks here. Hi. I, I just want you to I refer you to the chat room because I've been logging, I've been following your interview, but I just wanted to say I mixed up the people you were talking about with someone else that I caught on Amazon as well. And I mentioned you er mentioned earlier that you do a lot of book buying from Amazon, which is I do too. So I just refer you to the chat room because I, I post all that stuff on the chat room, but I just want to thank you. But I do have one question. Uh, Owen Dobson, is he still memorized at Howard University or has he been one of the forgotten high heroes we've had? Well, I, I was at Howard a long time ago. <laughs> okay. I graduated and from the theater department a long time ago. And when he I was he back there, he was back. He's a right. Back there with he was, he was not, and, right. He was not. He he was gone already when I got yes, there. Yes, yes, yes. So um, he's one of the people that you know people look up to, and yeah. he was he was being looked up to when I was there a long time ago. Yeah, yeah. like you said, keeping the women's stories going. I like to keep the men's stories going, and he's one of them. Owen Dobson. Yeah. yeah. He remind me of Joseph Papp here in New York City. Yes, yes, absolutely. But thank absolutely. you. Another panelist, Deborah, did you have a comment? Is Deborah with us? Oh, oh okay, not not yet. <laughs> okay. Well. Yahuda, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Did you have a comment for our guests today? Um, just that it was very, um, very, I enjoyed the interview. And I thank Mrs. Tyree for sharing her experiences and knowledge. And I would like to just, you know, I guess if I could get some information as to maybe some things, some things that she's doing in the future as far as presentations and, you know, things like that, that I can, you know, check out and look into. Okay, well, I can definitely forward that information to you. Uh, I did mention it in the 
at, at the end of today's interview, but I can forward that to you and my listeners as well. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. But yeah, I just, I just enjoyed, you know, just enjoyed the interview and just took everything in and um, thank, thank you. you again. Wonderful. I'd like to thank my listeners for tuning in to Analyze This with your host, Patricia Fields. And I also like to acknowledge my special guest for whom we had this wonderful interview with, Miss Tammy Tyree and her portrayal of Mrs. Elizabeth Keckley. If you would like to send a comment or question, you may do so at Analyze this at nunuradio.com. That's A N A L Y Z E T H I S at N U N U R A D I O.com. If you would like to send a donation, please feel free to do so at www.nunuradio.com. Wherever you are, please, please. Be safe, be well, and above all, stay spiritually grounded. Until next time, take care. Bye-bye.